Okay, so the title of my talk is an equation entirely unlike any of the familiar curves, Wittgenstein on the grammar of God and the meaning of religious language. Although there is little overt discussion of religious themes in Wittgenstein's magnum opus Philosophical Investigations, Wittgenstein's later philosophy has significant implications for an understanding of religious belief and language. A fuller picture emerges if what is said in the latter work is supplemented by additional material gleaned from Wittgenstein's various Cambridge lectures, his conversations with Rush Rees, and the collection of remarks known as Culture and Value. This material shows not only that religious questions were of the first importance to Wittgenstein, it also reveals that he grappled with these problems in a manner reminiscent of his general approach to philosophical questions. That is to say, in both philosophy and religion, Wittgenstein is choose metaphysical theorizing in favor of gaining clarity through the method of a grammatical investigation of our concepts. So what I'm going to do in this paper is I'll start by giving a general overview of some of the relevant themes from Wittgenstein's later philosophy before moving on to an in-depth examination of what a grammatical investigation of the concept of God involves and what problems it enables us to dissolve. So it's one of the most distinctive features of Wittgenstein's later philosophy that he believes that it's impossible to solve philosophical problems, as these are spawned, he believes, by conceptual confusion and illusion. The problems instead can only be dissolved by, to by putting together what we have always known, but have somehow lost sight of. In other words, philosophy is not a body of knowledge for Wittgenstein, consisting of a set of metaphysical truths, but rather the activity of logical or grammatical clarification or elucidation. The particular form our language takes can mislead us. The most basic misconception that Wittgenstein identifies in this respect, one that gives rise to a whole host of philosophical difficulties and misbegotten theories, is the temptation to think that where our language suggests a body and there is none, there we should like to say is a spirit. In other words, because our language is full of substantives and we naively assume that the meaning of a word is the object it refers to, Wittgenstein calls this the Augustinian picture of language as it's by no means peculiar only to philosophy. If we are unable actually to find such an object in the world, we take it that there must be a supernatural object or spirit that the word can refer to instead. Arguably, this was behind Plato's theory of the forms. The form of the good or of beauty can never be found in the myriad different objects we apply the words good or beautiful to, but only in a metaphysical realm of forms populated by the abstract objects that are allegedly the reference of these unadulterated essences. Similarly, mathematicians, including philosophers of mathematics, think that since number words cannot refer to empirical objects in the world, they must refer instead to abstract objects. Contemporary metaphysicians, on the other hand, often believe that propositions, properties, and truth makers are abstract objects to be investigated and theorized about. And of course, philosophers of religion and ordinary religious people often believe that the word God is the name of a supernatural object or entity. Now, quite often the arguments in favor of these assumptions are actually surprisingly thin, but we don't seem to notice this because it appears to us that things simply have to be the way the Augustinian picture suggests. That's to say we're primarily taken in by the fact that words like beauty, proposition, one or God appear to operate in exactly the same way as more ordinary words whose reference we can straightforwardly point to. Words such as cat, table or chair, for example. From this, we go on to draw the conclusion that in the former case as well, there must be objects these words stand for. It's just that they happen not to be empirically locatable. In other words, we are taken in by the surface grammar of our words, 
how our words appear to function linguistically in a sentence, even though this may not be a good guide to what is really going on. So Wittgenstein explains this in the following quote. In the use of words, one must distinguish surface grammar from depth grammar. What immediately impresses itself upon us about the use of a word is the way it's used in the sentence structure, the part of its use, one might say, that can be taken in by the ear. And now compare the depth grammar, say, of the verb to mean with what its surface grammar would lead us to presume. No wonder one finds it difficult to know one's way about. So when Wittgenstein says, for example, at Philosophical Investigations 122, that our grammar is deficient in surveyability, what he means, I think, is that the depth grammar is still unclear to us. All we see is the surface grammar, the mere syntactical structure of the word or sentence, the use, as it were, that can be taken in by the ear, not the actual use, what early Wittgenstein would have called the logical syntax of the sign the rules for the correct use of the word, which can be hidden underneath the word's apparent use, the surface grammar, in the way that the real form of a body may be obscured by a person's clothes, as Wittgenstein already notes in the Tractatus. Attending to the depth grammar, however, requires a willingness to look beyond the surface, to refuse to be taken in by superficial linguistic appearances that may lead one astray. This, of course, is difficult as the surface appearance may be attractive and tempt us to want to continue to view the problem in the accustomed manner. For this reason, Wittgenstein thinks that the struggle for clarity requires both an intellectual effort as well as an engagement of the will. We need the intellectual acumen to see through the deceptive appearances, but also require the willpower to resist the spell that language casts. As Wittgenstein says in a famous quote, a picture held us captive and we couldn't get outside it for it lay in our language and language only seemed to repeat it to us inexorably. So I'm now going to try and apply some of the insights um, of Wittgenstein's later philosophy of religion to an understanding of religious belief. And of course, in the philosophical investigations themselves, there is only one famous remark about theology and no other remarks about religious matters at all. So at PI 371, Wittgenstein says, essence is expressed in grammar. And then at 372, grammar tells what kind of object anything is, theology as grammar. So it seems that Wittgenstein believes that one of the main confusions that arise in philosophy, and of course other domains as well, is to mistake a grammatical or logical feature of a concept for an empirical one, and to end up predicating of the thing what lies in the mode of representation. And I think that the comparison with theology and the concept of God is supposed to make this apparent. And a passage from the recently published lectures from the early 1930s throws more light on what Wittgenstein might have in mind here. So he says on page 321 of, of that recently published volume, now A, suppose God means something like a human being, then he has two arms and he has four arms are not grammatical propositions. But B, suppose someone says you can't talk of God having arms, this is grammatical. So if we think that the word God is the name of something very akin to a human being, then saying that this God has two or four arms would not be different from offering a straightforward empirical description of something. For example, this animal has two legs or this animal has four legs. Here we're describing something contingent that could be otherwise had the world been different in some way. But if we say something like it makes no sense to speak of God having arms, then we are making a grammatical remark that shows that it's part of the concept of God that we can't attribute certain physical features to him. It's not that God is an entity who just happens not to have these characteristics. So in this respect, what Wittgenstein means by grammar is heir to what metaphysicians regard as necessary truths. 
That is to say, Wittgenstein thinks the notion of grammar replaces the notion of necessary truths. That is to say, the essential features of our concepts are Wittgenstein things specified by the grammar of the concept. So to give a non-theological example of this, to say that one is a number is not to attribute some predicate, that of numberhood, say, to an abstract object, but to tell us how the word one functions in our language, namely as a number word. So we're not talking about a necessary truth here, according to Wittgenstein, but about a grammatical remark. Similarly, to say that red is a color is to say something about the grammar of red, not to give a description of an esoteric object. To think otherwise is precisely to predicate of the thing what lies in the mode of representation to believe one is tracing the thing's nature when in fact you are giving a rule for the correct use of a word, that is to say something grammatical. And many philosophical and theological problems arise if one doesn't heed this distinction. In a very illuminating conversation with Rush Rees from 1945, Wittgenstein says, our statements about God have a different grammar from our statements about human beings. And if you try to talk about God as you would talk about a human being, you're likely to come to talk nonsense, to ask nonsensical questions and so on. In talking about God, we often use images or parts of images that apply to human beings. This is so when we say, wherever you are, God always sees what you do. We know how this statement is used and that is all right. So we may speak also of God's hearing our prayers. You might say then that in our picture of God, there are eyes and ears, but it makes no sense if you then try to fill in the picture and think of God as having teeth and eyelashes and stomach and tendons and toenails. So we might say that our picture of God is like a picture of a human being with holes in it, which means that the grammar of our language about God has holes in it if you look at it as the grammar of statements about a human being. In describing our picture of God, we may speak of it as being made up of parts of a picture of a human being, together with other things which have no resemblance to any part of a human being. You might start the description of a curve by taking drawings of familiar curves, a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, a hyperbola. Then describe it by saying, you see, here it's part of a parabola. There then it's part of a circle. Here it's a straight line which goes into part of a spiral, etc. And the curve you describe might then have an equation entirely unlike any of the familiar curves. End of quote. So unpacking Wittgenstein's line of reasoning here, this passage seems to contain the following four points. One, if you try to talk about God as you would about a human being, you're likely to speak nonsense, ask nonsensical questions, etc. Two, in talking about God, we nevertheless use images or parts of images de de derived from ordinary talk about humans, e.g. wherever you are, God always sees what you do. Three, these similarities may obscure the grammatical differences between God talk and ordinary human being language. Four, if so, three may either lead us back to one and the conclusion that the grammar of our language about God has holes in it, or we come to realize that the similarities notwithstanding, we actually have an equation entirely unlike any of the familiar curves. So in the rest of the paper, I'm going to try and elucidate what points one and four imply for how um, Wittgenstein's for how to understand Wittgenstein's contention that in respect to our picture of God, we have an equation and enti entirely unlike any of the familiar curves can be understood. Because I think if we have an understanding of what Wittgenstein means by the latter quote, um, then we're going to understand much better what Wittgenstein means when he talks about the grammatical differences between ordinary human being language and some of human images, um, the function of some of the human images, how they work when they're applied to God. Okay, so let's start with the question, why would one speak nonsense if one were to talk about God as one would about a human being? 
It seems that Wittgenstein thinks that's primarily the case because we would very quickly end up saying all sorts of ridiculous and blasphemous things. Now, the clearly ridiculous things, according to Wittgenstein, would be asking questions such as, does God have toenails? Does God have a stomach? Such questions already sound a bit funny because they betray a category mistake. God is not, as it were, a gaseous vertebrate, Wittgenstein borrows this phrase from Heckel, with invisible tendons and toenails. So to treat God like an ordinary human being is to turn talk of God into talk of something um, that is more like an idol rather than say, like the monotheistic God of whom it doesn't make sense to ask whether this God has toenails or a stomach. Furthermore, in such an, as it were, pagan conception of God, um, a pre-monotheistic conception of God, if you like, um, if we were to construe God as something like the name of a gaseous vertebrate, we would immediately run into all sorts of other problems and difficulties. So, for example, if human grammar were entirely the right grammar for God, if there were no grammatical differences between human grammar and the grammar, um, how the grammar works in, in the case of God, then it would make sense to ask the following further questions. Where does God live? Is it possible to find his home? Is God bored, etc.? And of course, if we thought it made sense to ask such questions, then the monotheistic God would not really differ very much from the Greek God, say, who live on Mount Olympus and get into the kind of difficulties that human beings would also easily get into. So these Greek gods basically act like human beings. They, they have love affairs. They, they get into battles with other gods. They, they basically behave exactly like human beings. They just happen to have more powers. Now, one might think that, apart from the militant atheists who believe that people engage in religious practices out of sheer stupidity, there are not many Christian theologians or religious believers who would be happy to ascribe this kind of human grammar to the word God. But such appearances would be deceptive because quite often, this, as it were, pagan conception of God, one that anthropomorphizes God and conceives of God as a kind of superhuman, comes dressed in metaphysical garb, which can make the crudeness harder to spot. For example, the God of analytic theism is conceived as an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good person without a body, where a person without a body is usually regarded in Cartesian manner as a purely mental substance. So here the idea is that human beings have both a mind and a body, where if you happen to be a Cartesian or neo-Cartesian, these words would be thought to refer to two distinct substances or, entity, or entities. Hence, if God is like a person but lacks a body, he comes out on this analytic theist view as being a super powerful mental substance. And of course, this makes the God of analytic theism very much like this gaseous vertebrate that Ernst Haeckel talks about. Now, quite apart from all the other problems that such a conception raises, the gaseous vertebrate view is clearly driven by the Augustinian picture of language. The meaning of a word is the object it stands for. God being a proper name, one might think, i.e. the name of a person, but obviously not of a physical one with tendons and toenails, must therefore be the name of a disembodied one, a purely spiritual being. So here we see in practice um, what Wittgenstein said earlier at PI 36, where our language suggests a body and there is none, there we should like to say is a spirit. In other words, the surface grammar of the word God tempts us to think that God names a human-like object, when really Wittgenstein is suggesting the depth grammar is quite different. But how do we work out what the depth grammar is? In the same way as we would with any other word, 
by attending to its overall use in the language or practice. So Wittgenstein says in a quote in Culture and Value, actually, I should like to say that in this case too, the words you utter or what you think as you utter them are not what matters so much as the difference they make at various points in your life. How do I know that two people mean the same when each says he believes in God? And just the same goes for belief in the Trinity. A theology which insists on the use of certain particular words and phrases and outlaws others does not make anything clearer, Karl Barth. It gesticulates with words, as one might say, because it wants to say something and does not know how to express it. Practice gives the words their sense. What Wittgenstein seems to be saying here is that it's not possible to find out what someone means or indeed whether two people mean the same merely by looking at the words these people use. For they can use the same words and yet mean something completely different. The Augustinian picture glosses over this important insight by insisting that all that matters to meaning is reference. As long as we have some idea of what the objects are, that the words in question are supposed to refer to, then we know what the words mean. But this, of course, is very simplistic. Not only is reference itself a word in the language, which might not have a, con a context in variant use, so reference might mean slightly different things in different contexts, but knowing only that the word stands for some object does not give you the rules for the correct use of the word. This is why Wittgenstein spends so much time talking about ostensive definition at the beginning of philosophical investigations. An ostensive definition will only teach me the use of a word if the overall use of the word in the language is already clear. That is, if I already know what a name is, for instance, and how it functions. Now, I take it that when Wittgenstein mentions Karl Barth in the passage from Culture and Value, He's referring to Barth's conception of the Trinity as three ways of being. So Karl Barth calls this Seinsweisen. Barth wanted to replace standard three personal or modal conceptions of God, where God is regarded as manifesting himself either as three persons or as one person in different modes, with his own preferred version of ways of being. Presumably, Wittgenstein is criticizing Barth for merely insisting on a different form of words instead of clarifying the actual use of the word Trinity. That is to say, Wittgenstein seems to think that banning one form of words while allowing another will not deepen my understanding of the relevant concept unless the new form of words makes a significant difference to the religious practice itself. If it makes no difference which form of words is used, then these words are like idle wheels, a wheel that can be turned through no though nothing else moves with it is not part of the mechanism, as Wittgenstein says at PI 271. So, for example, if I think that God is an invisible human with four arms, then this must, if it is to count as a genuine belief rather than as an empty mouthing of words, have some implications for how I relate to this God and the rituals that I participate in. If, on the other hand, what I believe makes no difference to what I say and do, then this casts serious doubt on whether I really mean what I claim to mean. Wittgenstein's kindred spirit, the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, is good on this point. Kierkegaard spent most of his pseudonymous authorship trying to expose the monstrous illusion the false self-conception of the Christians in Christendom who believe that being a Christian and being a good citizen are the same thing. These soi-disant Christians thought they were Christian and professed to be Christian, even though their lives were in fact very far removed from Christ's teachings. Now, one can of course wholeheartedly endorse these points, but nevertheless wonder whether Wittgenstein's criticism of Barth is entirely fair. For regardless of what Bart's own specific intentions were, and I'm not going to speculate about those, one could read Bart's proposal in a more Wittgensteinian manner as an attempt to clarify the grammar of the Trinity. That this would then not merely be an idle move would manifest itself in a way similar to what Wittgenstein himself wants to achieve in philosophy, the vanishing of a problem 
and the loss of the desire to ask certain nonsensical questions. So in the rest of my talk, I'm, I'm just going to give this alternative grammatical reading of Barth, irrespective of whether Barth would him himself have endorsed something like this. So Barth thought that talk of a three-person God leads to the two standard theological ways of conceiving of the Trinity, tritheism and modalism, both of which he found extremely problematic. Tritheism, for example, makes people ask, how can one God be three distinct persons? And how is this compatible with the alleged monotheism of Christianity? Modalism, on the other hand, is the thought that God is not triune in and of himself, but merely manifests himself that way in history. This, as the theologian Molnar notes, leads to a search for a God behind the God who makes himself known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Indeed, modalism, Molnar says, not only posits a hidden force behind the God who is eternally one and three, but for modalism, the divine subjectivity is sucked up into the human subjectivity, which inquires about a God that does not exist, as Barth says. In other words, modalism leads to a kind of regress problem where we have to posit a fourth God hidden beneath his historical manifestations, which might lead one to wonder whether there are further gods behind the fourth and so on ad infinitum. Barth's talk of science Weisen, I'd like to suggest, is supposed to avoid these problems. By no longer talking of personhood, which according to Barth implies an individual self-consciousness, we can avoid tritheism, as well as the opposite side of the coin modalism, and thus avoid nonsensical questions about the Trinity. Of course, this presupposes, and I presume this is where Wittgenstein's criticism comes in, that we have a clearer grasp of what it means to speak of God's ways of being than we do of talk of God's three personhood. And whether this is really the case will depend on whether this new way of talking will cure our urge to ask the, for, the aforementioned problematic questions and save us from the bumps that the understanding has got by running up against the limits of language. In the theological context, this might mean that Barth's conceptual clarification has enabled one to acquire a new way of thinking and speaking about God, which in turn allows one to participate in religious practices in a more wholehearted way, as we will no longer be plagued by certain questions that call the practice itself into question. In other words, the surface grammar of the concept of the Trinity might lead one to believe that the triune God is to be conceived analogously to three distinct human consciousnesses or persons, when the depth grammar is more fruitfully to be construed as operating along Barthian lines. On this interpretation, God's ways of being are not to be reified into three different entities distinct from God, just as the two different ways of seeing the duck rabbit figure that Wittgenstein discusses in the second part of Philosophical Investigations do not imply that the figure has two different natures corresponding to the two different ways of seeing it. So what are the consequences of these insights for the Barthian conception of the Trinity? Well, if we stay with the analogy of the duck rabbit, which might help us to see what's going on in the Barthian case, again, this is my interpretation, not necessarily one that Bart would, would endorse, just as we don't learn to see the rabbit aspect of the duck rabbit figure by discovering any additional purely visual features of the duck rabbit, so we don't come to believe in the triune god by making new discoveries about God's nature, for example, that he is really three. Rather, we experience what Cora Diamond calls a conceptual reorientation. Whereas before our conversion to Christianity or before we developed as Christians a deeper understanding of the Trinity, we might have had some idea of what it means to speak of a belief in God. The notion that God is three persons would probably have seemed foreign and opaque to us. We would have failed to have a use for this picture of God, failed to find an application for it in our lives. 
As previously suggested, such a failure could have been compounded by the various intellectual problems that arise from standard ways of trying to understand the concept of the Trinity, which might have led one to dismiss it as a nonsensical notion. So if as a result of Bart's conceptual clarification, one now recognizes that the grammar of a triune God should not be conceived along ordinary ways of thinking about human persons, namely as a conglomerate of three, then the way is paved for a conceptual reorientation to occur. And such a conceptual reorientation, I submit, is similar to learning to see new aspects in things. So that's why I brought in the duck rabbit. Whereas before I could not see how God might appositely be describable as triune, I'm now able to recognize that the same God can be seen under three different aspects without this requiring any strange metaphysical contortions. In other words, what I learned to see is that there is an internal relation between the concept of God and the concept of the Trinity. In other words, what the discussion of this example shows is just how important it is to get the grammar of our concepts right. For if we fail to do this, not only will we remain mired in confusion, these confusions, apart from being bad in themselves, can also prevent us from seeing important new existential possibilities. That is to say, if one believes, for example, that God is a gaseous vertebrate, then all the ridiculous questions that such a conception throws up may well prevent one from taking religious belief seriously. And I take it that this is true of many who describe themselves as militant atheists. If on the other hand, we are helped by Wittgenstein to see that despite similarities in, in surface grammar, we are actually confronted by an equation entirely unlike any of the familiar curves, then a life of faith might become a genuine possibility. So, that, as it were, is my conclusion and take home message. We should not be mesmerized purely by the surface grammar. We need to look beyond the surface and not necessarily assume that because something looks familiar, we're also able to understand the depth grammar. That's going to help us to avoid falling into various kinds of confusion. Thank you.